And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Franco Romero, top 10 best-selling author who, as a result of his near-death experience, left him as a clairvoyant. Franco, thank you for joining me today and welcome. Hey, thank you, Jeff. I really, really appreciate you having me on your show. Franco, can we start with your NDE and go from there? Yeah, uh, that's a good place to start. <laughs> I, I, I um, My NDE is a little bit, um, well, you'll probably hear this from a lot of people, but my NDE is a little bit unique in that um, what I experience in my NDE, I experienced it. Uh, the actual NDE actually happened when I was six months old. And so I had no idea I had had an NDE in, until much later in life when I was in my mid-teens. Um, so I want to start it off with that. The stuff that I'm going to tell you actually uh, were experiences that I had through visions and dreams that I started to receive in my mid-teens. Um, and then were validated later on when I approached my parents, specifically my mother, uh, about the experience. And, and she confirmed that everything that I had told her was precise in terms of all the details that happened on the night of my death. So with that said, when I was six months old, I, um, I was having some issues that appeared at the time to be just kind of your standard uh, cold and flu type, cold and flu type of symptoms. Um, my parents, my mom, uh, didn't really think much about uh, the situation at the time, but it got progressively worse. So she decided to take me uh, to the hospital just to, there's a kind of a local clinic hospital by our home. And she thought she would just have me checked out just to be sure that there was nothing going on. Um, so when she took me there, the doctors immediately realized that this was a little bit more than just some typical cold symptoms. There was something more happening. I was having a hard time breathing and it, 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 it um, occurred to them that I might actually have some form of bronchitis that was developing. And back then I, this was a really small town and I was born in South America and things weren't necessarily as technically advanced, even for, for those days uh, in the 60s, uh, as they are certainly today. Um, so they kept me for observation. Um, they weren't quite concerned at that moment that, that things were going to take a turn for the worse. But within a couple of hours of being there, uh, things did turn for the worse. Uh, uh, they put me in, in an incubator and they had doctors in and out and they were trying to figure out uh, exactly what was going on. My mother had already started inviting or bringing in, I shouldn't say invite, but she started bringing people um, over to, to help pray, to support. Um, she was a very, very uh, uh, Catholic, faithfully Catholic person. And um, so there was sort of this kind of vigil going on at that time, uh, but there wasn't really much that the doctors could really do other than just to try to try to see if they could control the fever that was going on and the uh, and the symptoms that were happening. Um, probably within about three or four hours of being there, so this was going really rapidly. Um, they one doctor took my mother aside and he took her out into the hallway and um, just right outside the door. And he told her that things were really progressing so quickly that they could see that my organs were starting to to shut down. And they really didn't think that I would make it through the night. Um, they asked if it would be OK to have the the hospital chaplain come in and and talk to her and the family and to basically uh, give me my last my last rites. Um, that took my mother. Um, <laughs> she just went into a big state of shock. She just had like 
uh, like this moment where she kind of blanked out and had a sort of an audio, out of body kind of an experience where she just the words were sinking in, but they weren't really being they weren't really resonating with her. Um, she went into the room, gathered a few of her things, and rather than what you would think uh, most people would do would be to actually stay there and be by their child um, at, in the final hours or moments, uh, she, as I said, was very devout, and there was a church not very far away, so she decided to go uh, to that church, and when she got to about a block away from the church, uh, she she could see it from the distance, and um, there was kind of like this little boulevard, and she got on her knees and crawled uh, to the church from that from that point on. She got into the church on her knees, went to the altar, and started praying. But the prayer that she that she had wasn't like your typical prayer where you actually kind of go, oh, you know, please, please, please. Um, you know, it was more of a, of a prayer of appreciation and gratitude. And she, she, she was so grateful for the opportunity to have had even a short period of time with me. She, she knew that I wasn't going to be around very long, but it wasn't a, a, a prayer of despair. It was really, it was really odd. Um, now I'm going to just kind of Fast forward back again to 15 or 16 years later, I was having a real rough time in, in my life where I just didn't really feel connected. I was I was so disconnected that that I was I was going through some small bouts of depression. I just couldn't figure out life from the standpoint of not just a teenager, but I was feeling like I wasn't from here. And so I was trying to figure out what that meant because I had no context within which to to put that in. I had no idea yet that I had died when I was six months old. So I, I did what I would what I was told to do typically, which was in my when I went to bed, I would have these deep, profound moments of prayer where I just like most of us, we just ask for clarity and um and that's when my visions and and uh, dreams started to to come in, which was to say that the first night that I had my my first dream, um, I saw the things that I'm describing to you. The, the I found myself in this hospital room and and all of the events that occurred. And I and I the the thing that was really kind of odd to me because you know typically in dreams you. You, you may feel your own feelings, but you don't necessarily feel the feelings and the energy of, of the people in, in, in the dream. But in my case, I actually could feel what my mother was, was going through. I could feel the anguish. I could feel the love, the compassion, the, the, great, the, the appreciation, all of that, the gratitude. And I could feel the room changing in terms of energy. Um, when she left the hospital room, when she went to talk to the doctor, when she crawled to on her knees to the church, all of those things, um, I heard I was it was it was as if I was actually just kind of standing right behind her throughout this whole thing. And I could feel her prayers. And, and I didn't necessarily always have to hear her prayers. I could feel her prayers. Um, I knew exactly the prayer that she had and, and how she said it. And and so when I went back into those dreams, it was as though I was actually experiencing them uh, real time. And the baby in that room, I knew after having had multiple, multiple visions and dreams from that point on of that same, of that same event, I knew that baby was me. But I didn't really know how to correlate that because I was like, so why am I having these dreams? Um, so anyway, back to the story, she actually then came back to the hospital. Well, I, I should mention that at a certain moment, and I've heard this from other people um, who have had um, experiences, either NDE experiences or more like STE experiences, where at a certain moment, there was this enormous amount of peace that sort of filtered into her, into her beingness. She was calm. She was relaxed. She was she wasn't scared. And so at that point, she got up and she went to the hospital. And when she got to the hospital, she was expecting to hear the bad news. 
And instead, she got flooded by family and by the staff and the doctors there with smiles and tears of, of joy. And she was really like, what's going on here? And they, the doctors said to her, when you, at, while you were gone, your, your child, your baby had this miraculous recovery. It literally was, she, he was literally dead his organs had pretty much collapsed, shut down everything. And all of a sudden, everything came back. And my vitals came back, everything came back. And they were trying to explain to her that they couldn't explain to her what had actually happened to them. She said that um, she said that they basically told her it, it was it was a miracle. And back in those days, and even today, doctors tend to kind of, you know, label something like that, and then they just kind of move on. They just, you know, to the next thing. They don't really try to, 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 to uh, examine it any further. They, they just, that's just not in their, in, in their DNA, so to speak, to do that. So everything just kind of got left as a miracle. I left the hospital a couple of days. And and life went on. A few a few couple of months later, we were on a plane to to the U.S. because we were moving here, and I've been here all along. But but there's a second part to this whole vision and this whole dream and the story, and that is that in addition to that imagery that I got, that vision, that those dreams, I also was having dreams where I saw the second half of what happened. But this time I was seeing it from the perspective of that little baby. And um, and what had happened was is that I saw myself standing over this this child. And I looked up and I could see that there was there was this light coming from outside of the room. And immediately when I looked back down, I was no longer in the hospital. I was in this huge desert area. I mean, it was just sand dunes everywhere. And when I, I looked down again, I saw this, this older gentleman, very, 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 very frail gentleman um, who was standing, who was sitting there looking at me with his hand stand, sticking out as if he was asking for something. And I didn't know exactly what was going on. I didn't know exactly what he was trying to do because he wasn't talking to me. He was just looking at me, but it didn't take very long for me to realize he wasn't looking at me. He was looking through me. And so I looked behind me and there was that light again, but this time it was now a huge orb. And it was probably at least five to 10 times bigger than, than the sun. And I remember looking at it and I was thinking, why isn't it hurting me? Why why am I not like being blinded by this? Because that light was so intense, but it just it was soft and it was and it was gentle and it didn't feel hurtful in any way. So then I looked back down again and I realized the older gentleman had left and now there was this little boy. And this little boy was exactly the same way. He was pretty destitute and he was looking at me and he was having his hands stand. He stuck his hands out and um he was looking through me, and so I looked back again, and now this orb was like right on top of me. And I didn't even look down anymore because at that point I could start, I could really start feeling the intensity of the light, but not as this kind of intensity where you would think of like heat. It was this intensity of, of compassion and and love and and blissfulness. And I was like, Oh wow. <laughs> I didn't really at that point I didn't I didn't care about anything. I felt so connected to this light that I just basically let it drip, you know, pull me in. And as I came into the light, I could feel all of my vibe all so I knew that I didn't really have a body at that point. I just felt this ethericness. And at the time I couldn't describe it that way, but I just it was just like I had the semblance of a body, but it wasn't really there. But yet I could still feel that there was this vibration that was coming from, from the light. And it was, again, really intense. And I could feel it, it literally vibrating every cell in my body. So, you know, they say we have like 50 trillion cells in our body. And I felt 
every single cell vibrating, but it was vibrating like as if it was really like thirsty for that light. And the, the cool thing that I, I really, really, I've never forgotten to this day was that I didn't feel the body, my body shaking and trembling from the vibration as if I felt, you know, all these things happening inside of me. I actually took on the consciousness of 50,000, I mean, 50 trillion cells in, in an instant. It's hard to explain this, but in an instant, I felt, and, and I, I, this is the only way I could describe it, 50 trillion blissful moments that the closest thing I could describe it to is like 50 trillion orgasms. I mean, it was crazy. I, I felt it all. And yet I could also feel that I was part of this oneness of what I thought was myself. It was, you know, here I am, you know, 15, 16 years old. And I'm like going, I have no idea what I'm experiencing. I don't know if I could have really have described it or understood it even later on in life. Um, anyway, I got pulled into the light. I was completely immersed in the light. I was 50 trillion entities of myself in the light. And I remember getting so close into the light that I could start hearing these sort of messages coming through. And I'll, I'm sure you know, because you've had a lot of NDE people on that, you don't hear it like audibly. There, it isn't a voice. It, it's a vibrational essence. It's a thought form. And, and, and it comes in packs. And so I could feel that something was telling me a story and they wanted me to move deeply into the light because they wanted me to remember something that I would eventually one day have to describe. And, and that was that as I got so into the light and, and I, this was like rapture city. I mean, I'm like done. I don't want to be anywhere else, but there, um, I noticed that the light wasn't just one big light. It was actually infinite number of little lights that made up this one big light. And I remember that they told me, they said, you will have to remember this someday because this is important. This is something that we don't know as humans what the, the magnitude of that, of that imagery is. In other words, at that moment, I realized that this thing we call God or source or whatever you wanna call it, um, isn't just this being and we somehow have a little aspect of it in us. It's a being that actually where we are in it as much as it is in us. In other words, it cannot exist if it wasn't for the collective of trillions and trillions of, of light. So they were trying to show me that we are all truly, this was like the best imagery of what oneness could actually look like and feel like. And, and that message later on in life became really huge because of the way that I approach and view things now and the way that I teach others uh, about how to view themselves. So anyway, that imagery, I was just in that moment for I don't know how long. It felt like forever. But at a certain point, a couple of those silhouette beings did approach me. And, and the, the crazy thing was that I felt like I knew every single light that was in that big orb it felt like family to me but in, in particular those few that did approach me i felt like they were like i had lived lifetimes with them they didn't have a face um so i couldn't make them out but i felt them as though they were family and and not family from here or not family that had had passed away years ago or from other lifetimes this was like family from different places and different times and different universes and different dimensions. And, and I knew them as that, and they knew me as that. So they came up to me and they embraced me. And at that moment, I felt another wave of like super blissfulness and I understood them and they just, they didn't say anything to me, but I felt them hug me. And I, I didn't know if I had hands or arms, but it didn't really matter. I felt like the super embrace and I could feel that they were kind of instilling something in me, but I didn't really question it. I didn't care. I was like, do whatever you want to do. I'm here. At that moment, 
I felt something on my shoulder and I could feel it was like this energy that was telling me it was time to go. And so I got pushed, I got held in the shoulder. And I, I, you, you hear stories like that where you just feel this entity and it's telling you to go and boom, it just, all of a sudden, I, I just shot out of that light and I was in this kind of tunnel with brilliant light everywhere. And I'm like flying at the, faster than the speed of light. And at least it felt that way. And then all of a sudden, bam, I land on my bed and I am sweating and I am crying. And the reason I'm crying is because it was so beautiful. It was so real. It was so who I knew I was and am. I had no interest in wanting to be back here. Um, and so in essence, I experienced the death and the crossing over years later, but I experienced it as if it were happening at that moment. And people ask me, well, how is that possible? And I tell them because in the metaphysical world, there is no such thing as time and space in the way that we know it. There, it's Everything happens in the moment of the now. And so you can literally transform yourself multidimensionally and universally and you name it parallel wise in an instant you can experience something like that in an instant real time and so um it was incredible and i would have those dreams and visions for years later which suffice it to say since there was no internet there weren't shows like yours i had no way to reference any of this stuff it, it was really a real tough time for most people who have these kind of experiences and have no way to reference them it, it becomes a very very lonely and depressing time trying to sort this out on your own um i tried my best through my 20s to tuck it under the rug but um what happened was that in my i started i started recalling things so for instance uh, back in my youth, uh, when I was about seven years old, through about 12, I lived in what you would call the hauntings. So basically, you know, it was the exorcist uh, meets poltergeist meets whatever in, in our home. And so I was really at an early age introduced to, to what a lot of people would call the paranormal. Um, and the crazy thing was that for me, it was normal because I thought everybody was going through this kind of an experience. So those kind of events were events that not only did it expose me to the paranormal, but it exposed me to uh, an entity, a collective consciousness that later on would become a consciousness that became my friend. Um, at the time, it was like my friend. Um, it, the, it was, uh, some might say it was like a, an imaginary friend, but for me, it was completely real. So when we would have hauntings in our home, um, <clears throat> this voice would come to me it was gentle. It was, it was beautiful. It was serene. It was, it, it, it always comforted me and always would tell me, don't worry. They won't hurt you. It won't hurt you. Meaning the, the sort of the negative energy that was in that space. And they would always say your light shines too brightly. They won't hurt you. And I was like, okay, <laughs> that's enough. I, it was always like, just before I would go to bed, they would show up they would come for me and I would go to bed. But we had some crazy stuff that happened in that home for five years. Later on in life, I would have what a lot of people would call STEs. Before we get into that, let me ask you a few questions yeah. first. You re-experienced this at about age 15 or 16. Yeah, it was, a, it was a period of about two, three years. When you woke up that day, what was going through your mind? Did you think you just had some strange dream or did you actually put it together that you re-experienced something from birth or from six years old? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because um, I did feel that I had had something that wouldn't normally be quote unquote labeled as normal. I, I It was too real. And especially since I would have, and this was something that I would have all throughout my life is that I would have dreams, similar dreams all the time I was reliving things in dreams. But that was the first time that I was really having something like this. And it was so real. And, and the intensity was so real that eventually I had to talk to somebody and I did talk to my mom. Um, and at that point, I sat down with her and, and because of what was happening or had happened just previously with the hauntings, um, 
I was really careful <laughs> about wanting to say something. You know, we had just had some really bizarre years in our life, and here I am coming out with some more visions and dreams about something that seemed just like out of this world. Um, but I sat down with my mom because I had to talk to somebody and she was the one that was in the dream. So I asked her, I said, you know, here's what I've been dreaming. Did this really happen? Can you help clarify what, why I'm having these? And she was in a state of shock. I mean, she was like, you know, I was like, did I say something that, you know, what happened here? Because the room, the energy just kind of went out of the room. And the first time that she heard it, she was like, oh, my God, everything you're describing, every single thing that you describe, even the thoughts that I was having, even the emotions. I was the only one that crawled to the church. Nobody saw me. All those things. Um, she said they were, I, they were exactly the way it happened that night. They were exactly and she goes, I don't know how you know this. I don't know why you know this, but you have to, you have to share this so that A, you can feel better about it. And B, you there, there's some sort of miracle that just happened here. And I um I didn't. I didn't because I was too afraid to. I was, I there were so many reasons that a lot of people tell the same story. You know, they just they're coping. Coping is probably the best way to put it. You you just had something that would that everybody would describe as out of this world. And how do you even try to make sense to it to others? Much I mean, I mean, it's hard for you to make sense of it, much less to try to get others to to buy it, to buy on to it. And so it, it was that's what caused sort of the spiral. That's what caused this sort of spiritual crisis that I went through. For, for decades, because I was trying to sort out what the hell just happened. Uh, what happened that night? And why has all of these, why have I had all of these events in my life? There was something that was trying to call out who I was really. I mean, there, I felt like there was something. There was like something that was trying to say, there's something more to this world. But I had no idea how to even decipher that. You know, again, it, I was 15, 16 years old at the time and in, into my 20s. What do you do at that time? You just try to move on and live life normally. You try to tuck all the paranormal and supernatural stuff under the rug as much as you can and live a quote unquote normal life, which ironically, we now know what is really normal, right? So yeah, I, I'm, I'm, that's, that was sort of the process that I went to and went through in order to just deal with life for, for a long time. Since you understood that we are all collectively God... Did that change your interactions with people at some point in your life? Do you recognize that, hey, this guy's also God, and if I treat him like God, things will interact differently? Yeah, well, uh, that that question could be peeled in so many different ways. And so I'll, I'll try to I'll try to do my best because I'm trying to put it in the perspective of, I think, what a lot of people are coping with, whether they're NDE years or ST years or whatever you want to call them. Um, those messages were stored in me. Uh, what I was shown, there were a lot of other experiences that in later years, I would re recant a, a lot of things that happened in, in that experience. And one of which was the experience of understanding the oneness and things like how this whole universe works and the reality and how this reality works. And, and yet the thing was that I was still trying to figure myself out as a human being, because that's the way I was identifying myself. That's the way we are taught to identify ourselves as, as human beings. And so, so putting it from that perspective, it was really hard for me to see the, the oneness of anything at that time. It was as though all this information was there. It's like when you, <clears throat> when you read something or hear something, you go, aha, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. But then putting it into into practice was a whole entirely different thing. So I had all of this wealth of information about, about all of this stuff that was metaphysical, but it took me a long, long time to see people, to see everything as oneness. In fact, a lot of what I do today with people um, who come to me and, and want to work with me is that I, I try to show them that perspective almost immediately, because that's a huge piece to all of a sudden go from you're just this individual speck to all of a sudden you are an aspect of God. You, know, you don't just have a little light of divinity in you. 
you are the light that makes up God. And so, you, you know, that's a huge hurdle for people. And it was a huge hurdle for me. Um, it took me decades of, of a lot of inwardness to, to figure out what all of this was trying to say. All these messages were coming through. But I knew that in the bigger picture, Jeff, it had to do with what everybody was going to be going through. And, and so I, I did all of the soul searching, if you will, the inwardness, knowing that I had to do it for myself. But, but there was always this sort of guiding principle that others would have to go through it because it is a huge leap of faith to go from what we've been taught to believe about who we are to what we know ourselves to be a spiritual being. So it, it really, to answer your question, sorry, a little bit more succinctly, it wasn't until the last five or six, 10 years when I had my first awakening that I actually started to put the puzzle pieces together and see the oneness in, in what and what these messages were trying to convey. All right, so you lived with this experience for many years, but then are you saying five or six years ago, you finally had some type of STE where you processed everything and put it all together? Yeah, it was actually more like, so it was it was about 12 years ago now. It was during the period of 2009, 2012. And the reason I put it that way is because um, when I started to embrace who I was. I started to actually embrace the clairvoyant abilities that came with that. And so I was constantly getting a lot of imagery, visions, dreams. Um, I could start, I had some psychic abilities. Um, I started embracing it. That didn't mean I was going to you know, start living full-fledged it, but I started to embrace it. And in the in Around 2010, um, I was having the my sort of my spiritual crisis was 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 pretty much at its at its peak, and the reason for that is because um, I had an STE experience uh, some years before that, where um, I was at the airport in in Phoenix, and my uh, my wife Charlene at the, uh, and my and my kids, which at the time Logan and, and Savannah, they were very 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 little. And um, and I remember that I had to go get a car. I mean, so I went and got a car. I got the rental car. I went to go pick him up. I missed the lane that they were supposed to be picked up at. So I went over to the other side where you, all of the other buses and stuff pick up people. And um, and the the experience was was really incredibly profound. I I got out of the car and I went out to get their attention. So I I screamed over to. Uh, yelled over to to them to get them to see where I was at and then to cross over. The only one that saw me or heard me was my two year old and uh, Logan, and he immediately decided that he was going to just run over to me, unaware that there was a whole slew of cars coming. And I saw the cars coming. They were going at a really good clip. I knew that they weren't going to stop. I could just, I started sensing that the, that the, especially the car in the front, the one that was going to hit them, the woman in the car was not aware, wasn't paying attention. And I knew that he was going to die. So I did what any parent would do, which is basically, I just went deep within myself. I remember this process because it felt a little bit different than what I would normally do, but I just felt like this natural sense of wanting to go deep within me. And then I yelled out, well, I screamed out, no. And when I said no, everything in the airport, I mean everything, Jeff, started to vibrate. It was the wildest experience I could ever have imagined. I could see over to my left, the planes that were moving around on the, and taxiing to the runway. They stopped. The car stopped. The people stopped. The sound stopped. Everything stopped with that vibrational blast. And, 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 and right at that moment, I instantly went out of my body and went into the back seat of the car, the front car that was about to hit him. And I was still screaming, no. And I felt the vibration in that car. I saw the woman. I saw her passenger. <clears throat> they both, they both, she slammed on the brakes. She hits herself on the steering wheel. He goes forward. They're all f freaked out. I'm out of my body again. I get back into my body. <clears throat> I see everything. 
and this is really wild, I see everything in two-dimensional reality. In other words, for a brief moment, I saw the veil, the veil, this, this thing that we kind of describe as the field, the veil was waving in the wind. Remember, I just said that there was no wind, there was no sound, there was nothing, but I could see the vibration, kind of like when you see a, an earthquake and, and you see the, the visual of it, you can see the waviness of that, of that energy. I saw that, but it was up and down, left and right. And I realized, holy cow, everything is a screenshot. Everything's a movie. Everything's, it, it's, there was, it was just like as if I was watching a movie, a, a surround sound movie. It was like, it was crazy. And, and then all of a sudden it went back to 3D. And all of a sudden, everything picked up again. The cars started, except now the cars were going really slow and they stopped. And my son crosses the street. He's fine. We're all fine. And here's the real bizarre thing. I write about this in my book that if all that wasn't bizarre to begin with, what really got me was that nobody came to us to ask if we were okay. Nobody said, hey, you know, is he all right? Are you all right? Sorry, nothing. It was as if it never happened. People went on with their lives as if nothing happened, very robotic. And it was, that was the first time that I experienced the holographic reality, the holographic simulation of this life. I didn't know it at the time, but later on, I was told that that was my first introduction to it. And it changed my life forever um, because those were the kind of imagery and kind of messages that would come subsequent to those visions and dreams. Those are the messages that came back with me. So, um, so yeah, so so I've had all those moments and many other STEs that were just beyond explanation and really consistent with the laws of meta with metaphysics and quantum physics and and you name it. Um, it really helped me to put things together over time. Now that you've thought about it over time, what is your conclusion really of what this reality is? <laughs> it's a game. It's a, I mean, if you want to sum it up into one word or two, it's a game, three, actually. It's a game. But I talk about this in quite a lot of detail uh, in the book because actually I didn't know how to even begin to explain it. And when I wrote the book, I wrote the book in a channeled state with Caleb, which is the collective consciousness that I, that I channel. They literally took over and I just dictated. And they explain in, in great detail about the game, the simulation, the hologram, and why, first of all, how it works and why it, why it even exists relative to who we are and what we're experiencing. And, and the, the long and short of it is, and is that when we, we're in an earth school, okay? And, and as an earth school, we go through a simulated reality. And we do that because as aspects of God, okay, or God, we want to experience what we're not. In other words, when we, when we die and we cross over, we, we're just, we're not the, the, the duality that we experience here. We are love, we are peace, we are joy, we are bliss, we are, we are innocence, you name it. Those are the, those are the essences of, of this thing called God. However, to experience that, you need contrast, you need duality, and, if, and, and you need it for two reasons. One, so that you can appreciate who you really are. When we leave this world and we go back to where we, where we have always been, and quite honestly, where we still are, only a small aspect of ourselves are here. When we leave this place, we can go back with a greater appreciation of the divinity that we are. Because you can't appreciate something that you are unless you have some form of contrast to reference it by. So that's one reason why we experience this earth school. The second reason is because when we, when we experience duality, we create an energy of consciousness called desire. And desire is what creates in the metaphysical world. When you have desire, it doesn't come from a lack of things. It comes from having all of it and you want more. So we create desire. And that's how we, as God forms, actually grow metaphysically in light. 
we actually create new worlds by the virtue of experiencing something new and we desire more and more of it. And so in the metaphysical world, we create more and more of it. In the physical world, the physical world is just a place in which we can experience that so that we can create desire and therefore create expansion in the metaphysical world. Now, there is a third piece to this. The third piece is actually relative to what's going on now. And that is that we have, I told you my, my experience, my awakening happened around 2010. In 2009 and 12, there was a massive awakening that occurred on this planet. Now, not everybody experienced it. And those who did, they did it in various shapes and forms. But in 2009, 2012, which is very consistent with a lot of the prophecies that were, if you want to call them that, um, of, of some of the ancient texts and some of the ancient civilizations that were saying that the end of times were, were going to be around that time. But what everybody misunderstood, even some to this day, is that it wasn't about the end of the world. It was about the end of this consciousness that existed in what we call three-dimensional or three de three density, or whatever it is that people call it. It's a, it's a state of beingness. The school, the school was ending. Okay, now go a little further after 2012. <clears throat> and by the way, only about maybe eight to 10 million people really experienced any form of an awakening during that time. But it was enough. Some people drastically changed their lives and some people just had this feeling or calling or wanting to do something different in their lives. It doesn't really matter. In 2012 to 2019, we had what was called the, the introduction of the fourth dimensional energies, okay? And, and nobody talks about the fourth dimensional energies, except that it's really important for this earth school. And the reason it's important is because that's where you start developing awareness. So in the book, I, it, that energy is described as the inner child. And, and there's a lot of reasons for it. And, it's, and it really doesn't quite go back to just because, you know, of innocence and stuff, but it does. But the inner child is an enormous, entity of energy awareness and we have to go back inward if you go into some of the many of the teachings of eastern tradition and western tradition if you if you read some of the texts you'll see references to how you can't get into the how you can't get into the kingdom of heaven or you can't walk through the gateless gate without knowing yourself as a child and and that's a state of awareness where you really become one with yourself, with yourself first. And when you do that, then you're able to receive the fifth dimensional energies, which by the way, we're in now. And it's not one of those things that we go one day, one day, one day. No, it's here now. I've been telling people for some time now, and I'm, the reason I'm doing these kind of talks now is because I want people to understand that there is no more one day. The day is here now. We can literally change our world, our reality, and get into this thing of called the kingdom of heaven if, or, the, or go through the gates of heaven, whatever you want to call it, now. Now. But you have to understand what you as a spiritual being <clears throat> came here to, be, to do. Understand yourself as God. Understand that you're playing a game, a, a simulated holographic game that allows you to experience yourself in what you're not. And then the third piece, to wake up, to wake up. And if you can do that, you start to actually experience not just yourself as God, but everything, the oneness that you were asking me about. You can manipulate anything you want because the fifth dimensional energies, you've, you've heard this from so many people. When that, when that finally gets integrated into our system, there's a whole binary coding thing. We don't have to get into that. But it is part of the game. You really will have heaven on earth. And that's why oftentimes I hear people talking about, you know, the fifth dimensional energies, it's coming. But in the meantime, this is going to happen. That's going to happen. You know, Armageddon, this and that, wars. That's all part of the purging process. But you have to look past that. If you if you can go in yourself, you will see that there is a enormous amount of energy ready to come out and change the narrative of this world right now. The irony of this whole thing is that 
we have been waiting for thousands of years for the very thing that we're capable of changing right now. We are part of the narrative. We are the ones that will bring forth this new energy and change the world. It isn't about waiting for anything anymore. It's here. And so it, it's ironic because we've spent thousands of years, just like when Yeshua came here and changed and changed the narrative. Thousands of years prior to that, they were waiting, waiting, waiting. And through that process, they created the opportunity for a Christ consciousness to come into this world. We've been waiting for thousands of years for the same thing, but now it's here. And so what I've been told about NDEers and about my experience is that those messages have been embedded in them. The reason why NDE people have NDE experiences isn't just to experience the other side and come back and tell people the story about how they saw the light. It's because genetically they've been altered with messages that when the frequency rises high enough, those genetic codings will be activated. And as much as this sounds sci-fi, there's a lot of science behind this. There's a lot of science that will validate that this isn't just a bunch of hocus pocus sci-fi imagination kind of thinking. This is actually the way energy does get activated. So that wave was the was the first 2009, 2012 was the first awakening. 2019 to 2022 was the second awakening, which was where a lot of the healers and a lot of the teachers, and now you're getting people who are talking about that they're walk-ins and nobody knew what that was, which which I'm a walk-in as well, but that's for another time probably. Um, then 2009, 2029, 2032 was the final final awakening where humanity by that point will know itself. So this is a very short period of time, will know itself as a spiritual being, oneness of spiritual being. And, the, and so a lot of the things that I talk about are the age of, mir the age of miracle, miracles. That's happening between now and, the, and 2032. You're going to see miracles like you've never seen before. Just incredible STEs every which way from Sunday some NDEs to real miraculous healing, everything. So the message that I want to convey to people is that it's now. And if you want this now, everybody has the ability to be clairvoyant. Everybody will be clairvoyant within the next 10 years. Believe it or not, this is going to be off the wall, but I'm going to say it anyway. Within the next 10 years, we won't have disease. We will not have hunger. We will not have death. We will not have all of the maladies and all of the hurt and pain that we have experienced. But you say, well, all right, bring it on. That's the trick. All of us have a role to play in that. We have to go inward to ourselves to activate not just our coding, to not just be the light for ourselves, but to be the light for others. That's what the Earth School is all about. That's the graduation of this Earth School. And just by the way, we're not the first to do this. You hear about all of these ancient civilizations, Lemuria and, and um, oh my God, Atlantis and all these others. They all ascended. Those were all earth schools that ascended. And it's not that they, well, they were probably catastrophically wiped out to erase what was there. But those are, those, that was intentional because they were long gone before that happened. And so that's how the earth schools work. And that's, we're not the only earth school. I mean, there are a lot of schools out there. We have lived many, many, many lives, many, many. And the ETs that come and go and all that, those are higher advanced beings who have already had an earth school type experience who are now here to help this school get through the birthing process of itself. And that's where we're at. And that's beautiful. That's exciting. Um, everything's going to get flipped right side up again not upside down. All these institutes, there will be no need for monetary systems. There will be no need for the healthcare systems that we have, the educational systems, the religious system. That doesn't exist in the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth dimensions. It just doesn't exist. There's no need for it. And so those are the messages that not just me, but other end years are going to start talking about as they start to remember what exactly happened when they crossed over right now on the planet there are over 8 billion people more yeah. people than ever perhaps is it possible all these people are here 
because they want to be here to witness the end of the simulation. Yes. Yes. If you want the short answer, yes. You, I could go off and, into another 20-minute discussion, but not everybody here is here to ascend. There are a, tr a significant number that are here, as I would describe them, as extras, and they know themselves as extras because they're here to help either witness or actually facilitate the process of the awakening and ascension that is going to occur. And they know that. Some of these are advanced, significantly advanced, advanced higher dimensional beings who are either observing or are, exact, are actually living with us right now. Some of them are lower, and I want to be real careful about this, lower vibrational entities who, let's put it this way, kind of like think of it as a movie where you finally get an opportunity to get that one extra role. You don't care. You just don't care. You just want to be in the movie. And so you get, sign me up. I'll take the, I'll take that role. I'll take that role. So I can experience this and see what it's all about and contribute in whatever way I can. Because one day in another school, whether it's a nurse school or what have you, they'll have their shot to be in the leading roles. Uh, so yeah. A lot, a lot of people on this planet are not here necessarily to do anything other than to experience the awakening for the joy of being part of it, but not necessarily to ascend. So you got that spot on. Are you saying by 2029 or 2032, basically the simulation will be over or school will be over and this will be just paradise? and some new earth school somewhere else will be created for people who want to start over or for new people needing to start for the first time. Wow. <laughs> you, yes, exactly. And I really, I really love the way you just said that. And I really am, when I say, wow, I'm really impressed by that because not everybody, not everybody necessarily knows the pattern of how earth, how schools like these work. But I go into a lot of detail about that in the book because some people ask, you know, what happens to those who aren't ready to, to ascend? And they do actually go uh, to another earth school type of simulation. And they actually are the ones that become the spiritual gurus in in that earth school or in that other reality because they like when anybody who has to retake a class they're kind of ahead of the curve already even though they failed it they still are ahead of the curve so they have a tendency to be um the ones that will sort of lead the charge in the next school so nobody gets left behind it just it's just where you're at with your evolutionary process as a spiritual being a godly spiritual being You've mentioned your book, and it's yeah. called The Closet Spiritualist. Do people find it on your website or Amazon? They, they could find it on, on my website, uh, which is just uh, www.theclosetspiritualist.com. The or, or they can go on Amazon, or they can go to my indie publisher, which is lulu.com. You can find it there, too. So there are a number of different ways, Barnes & Noble. You can find it in, in a number of different ways. And and the book, basically, as I said, was, was written in a channeling state. And I really do mean that because I had no intention of writing a book. And this is how it all got started for me, which was to say, in terms of me speaking out about what is happening, um, just some years ago, I, I felt the calling to write a book and I never written a book. I didn't know how to write a book. And I would go into my room the way I had gone into my room many times to get a, a download, a, a channeling message and, uh, just started writing, just wrote, 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 had no idea. My wife would go, what did you write about today? I said, I don't know. I got to read back because I have no idea what I wrote. And, uh, and the chapters were formed. But at the end of the day, the book not only chronicles uh, my life relative to the struggles that I went through, because I, it was really important that, that I show people that who I am today in terms of a, a well, I call myself a spiritual guide, like a physical spiritual guide to, to people. Um, that just didn't happen overnight. That didn't, you know, I didn't just one day become 
you know, enlightened to the extent that I am now. It, it went through struggles, hills and valleys. And the idea is that we don't have to do that anymore. The 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 idea is that none of us who are waking up now have to go through decades of that. Those people who started waking up early, including the NDOers who went through their ND early, they're here to help facilitate this so that people don't have to take the final exam, which is the practicum, the practical, which is the take all of what you know and actually apply it to this world. Um, they don't have to do it with with the pain and the, the pain and anguish that some of us did. So the first half of the book is talks about that. It does it within the context of things of the of the dream state, how we dream and how and, and the, the dreaming is part of the game and and um, how we how we interact with the game in terms of our thoughts and emotions and how how we create reality by using those two energies to form feelings and then communicate to the genetic DNA of the matrix. And that's how we communicate, not because the DNA or the, the universe is anything different than us. What we come to find out is that it's the matrix, if you want to call it, that, the, sol the holographic simulation, the game is actually part of our own fabric. We, we're not separate. And so we have the ability to communicate with it and manipulate it. So, so I, I, I go through the process of explaining how that all evolved in my life to the end where I start talking about the prophecies of what we already talked about, which is the, the, the end of the end of this game in the coming of the, of, of uh, heaven on earth. Um, that's what the book was meant to do is to try to bring it down to a level where people can understand that I'm just an average Joe. I, I didn't, I, everybody who's going to do this is just, just average people. But they're not average. They're incredibly powerful spiritual beings. So, so that was the first book. The second book I'm writing is called The Modern Day Alchemist. And it really gets into the nuts and bolts about how, and it's not meant to be detailed in a sense. It's not, you know, latent with a lot of a lot of scientific jargon and that. It's meant to understand that everything we're creating, we're creating through our minds, that the world that we're experiencing is actually and world is in our minds and and that we're not in it and we get into how how we actually start to interact with it with language that it understands um and on and overcoming things like fear and and uh and forgiveness and things that are blocking us from being able to to effectively communicate because when you can start to break those barriers down that's when the magic begins that's when the miracles begins that's our entry into the world of the supernatural, which by the way, we call it the supernatural, but it's actually in everywhere but here, it's our natural state. We're actually living in a subnatural world right now. Mm. We are blessed with all of these abilities. I like that, that we live in a subnatural world. It's true. <laughs> well, it's good that you're writing another book because I have a reason to have you back. Yay. <laughs> so when you when you when that's published, let me know. Would it be accurate to say that we're close to the end of the simulation or yes. the end of the simulation is coming? Yes. In fact, when I when I was writing the book, um, Caleb and Caleb is a collective consciousness. So it's not just one voice. It's like a room full of voices of which you're of which you, Jeff, and others are your higher beingness is in that room. Um, and that's how clairvoyance and, and psychics work, is their ability to tap into that that stream of consciousness in some way, shape, or form. But to answer your question, yes, we are. We are. When I wrote the book, they said to me, when the book is finished, the game will end. And I said, well, what, what does that mean? Tell me, tell me, tell me. Through the process of writing the book, I completely understood that, that the game, this simulation, it's kind of like thinking of, you know, the kind of games that our kids play, you know, there's levels. We're at the end. We're at the top of that game. And the only way to continue is to play a new game, a new version of the game or a new game entirely. We are at the top. And that's why that time frame is really, really small. We're not talking hundreds of years like some people go, oh, someday, oh, I don't know. No, no. I, 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 when I decided to start talking about this, I said, all right, 
look, I'm going to stick my neck out here, but I know this is what you're telling me, right? <laughs> just, I just want to be sure I'm getting this right. And they were like, yes, yes, we are now at the end of the simulation. The only thing left to do is to wake up and actually master the game, which I always tell people, you know, you, you hear about the great masters of our time. They weren't spiritual masters in the sense that they, that they somehow mastered the spirituality of things. They mastered the game. They were masters of the game. They knew how to control it. They knew how to become it. And that's how they evolved. So yes, we, we are definitely at the end. And what I keep telling people is what's coming, what is already here, what's bubbling up from, the, from, from way below to the surface, what's ready to come out. And what's, when I say it's ready to come out, it's already here. It's, it's everywhere. It's flowing through us and around us. We just have to vibrate at that frequency. We just have to get to that frequency. Because I got to tell you, having tapped into it, Jeff, it's the most amazing sense of oneness that you can possibly fandom. And we, once we get there, once we get all, it's done, it's over, we've crossed. It's, it's the ascended part of, of what's called the higher levels of the fifth dimension, which is where, like I told you, in, in 10 years, we're going to be there. And it's hard to fandom that, but it's coming and it's beautiful. It's really, really, really beautiful. And people, I, I just want to tell me one more thing. I've been blessed with talking to people all over the world now. And I've worked with people all over the world. And here's a common denominator. The ones who are very tapped into their clairvoyant abilities are all saying the same thing. They know it's the end. They have this enormous compassion for humanity. It sees humanity finally realizing who it is individually and as one. And the changes that they see are identical, identical to everything that I'm seeing. And it's coming in the next few years, decade at the most. But it's happening now. It starts now by, by all of us not being afraid of what we're hearing and seeing in terms of the voices we hear and the messages. Because people are waking up in droves now in droves in fact by the time by the time we finish uh, probably about one earth year we've gone from eight to ten million people that are awake to 800 million people awake that's massive and those people are going to be confused and they're going to be unsure what they're hearing and they're going to think that they're scared and they're going to think that they're crazy and they're going to go and get depressed and they're just feeling the natural symptoms of waking up that's it. And once they realize that, away they go. It's going to be a beautiful thing. So I do have a little angst about some people that, that you, you ask them, you know, what's going to happen? And they say this and the that and the gloom and the that. They're just seeing a little snippet of what's happening on the surface of, of this whole thing. And that's, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that, but they're just picking up that frequency. And what I'm seeing is literally the age of miracles heaven on earth. And that's not just me. It's I've been so blessed to be able to talk to gurus and healers and all sorts of people from all over the world who are seeing the same thing too. It's a really exciting time for humanity. I'm really, really optimistic and hopeful that the game will end soon and we will start a new chapter that's going to be absolutely epic. Like they say, heaven on earth, the golden age. Franco, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Because those are the people that are really ready. Um, they're having their defining moments in their spirituality. And I'm happy to the extent that I can to have them reach out to me. And I will do my best to answer questions. Um, some may choose to want to be students of mine because those are the ones that will one day become the teachers. I really believe that the people who are waking up right now, Jeff, are the ones who will go out and, if you will, minister this new reality to, to humanity. And um, in fact, that's what, they, what Caleb showed me. And so I'm happy to, to engage with them. So um, if they want to reach me, they just can go on my website. Again, it's uh, the closet spiritualist. I got to emphasize the piece of it. Uh, www.theclosetspiritualist.com, or they could just e email me at info 
at theclosetspiritualist.com. Before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Well, um, I'm hoping that a lot of my messages were positive, but with one, I guess the biggest message that I want to convey to people is that there is a beautiful um, act, there's a beautiful energy that's entered into this world and it's entered into everybody. Anybody who's listening to this is going to have some type of a STE. I promise you that, okay? Because they're being activated to do something that they didn't think they were capable of doing. Every one of us is needed in order to change what is happening in our reality. Gandhi once said, right? You have to be the change that you want to see in the world. And that to me was a clue, a message. And that's what I want to convey with people. It doesn't have to take you doing great things in your mind to change anything. Go within, listen to that voice inside of you. It's there. It's calling you. The reason you're listening to this show, I promise you, is because you were guided to this. If you do that, you can not only be the light to your world, but you will be the light to the world. You have that kind of power. And right now in this time in humanity, that is exactly why you came. And it's time for you to shed your light on the world. Franco, thank you for that message. And thank you for being my guest. Thank you. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.